um, focusing on Apollo 15, which took place 50 years ago this year. Can you believe that? And um, so for people who are not familiar with it, we've been doing a series over quite a period of time now, since 2019, and we've been calling them the Footsteps to the Moon. It was originally a countdown to Apollo 11. We've now changed it and we're, since that 69, uh, 2019 event, we've looked at the missions of Apollo 12, Apollo 13, Apollo 14, which happened in June of January of this year. And now we're looking at Apollo 15. So uh, this is a nice art week they did of the Apollo 15 crew on the moon with the lunar rover, which was gonna be the first used on this mission. All right, so about the series, uh, we did provide a monthly, because what, what I was thinking about back in 2018 when I was thinking about doing this, the massive amount of work that was happening between, well, the first manned Apollo mission, which was back in 1968. Of course, they had a 67 uh, disaster where the Apollo 1 crew died, so they basically went back and looked at everything, redesigned everything. So they had the uh, the first manned Apollo mission, which was Apollo 7, and then there was this massive amount of uh, work between each mission and in, in the months leading up to, well, the eventual landing in July 69. So I thought I'd, I'd document that. So I've been trying to do that over those that period of time. So it's been a lot of fun. So we summarised the various activities in the lead up to the missions and the missions that flew. Um, and we started once again in September of 68. We continued on to 60, uh, July 69, which was 50th anniversary, 20, July 2019. And we had our 2019 meeting at the um, Sun Theatre in Yarraville. Uh, we commemorated the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. It was a great, uh, great day. And it was pre-lockdown, so it was, uh, everyone had, was walking around with their faces uncovered. It was quite bizarre. So we've had decided to continue the series and uh, follow it up uh, to the last mission of Apollo 17. So next year, 2022, we'll have our look at Apollo 16 and 17. All right, first of all, we have to take ourselves back to 1971. So uh, everyone's got black and white TVs. This is the newly constructed Melbourne airport. Look at all that space around there. So that's what Melbourne Airport looked like in 71. We fast forward to 2021 and it's expanded quite a bit, but you will see some strange objects on the uh, runways and taxiways there. Well, they're all now out in the desert in uh, Alice Springs, a lot of those planes. So there's very few flights as people are probably aware. So. That's a bit unfortunate, but anyway, that's where a lot of the aircraft are stowed. We're still doing a bit of flying, but uh, it's nowhere near what it was. So hopefully this vaccine program, both domestically and globally, will help us to um, go back to the 20, uh, 1971 photo. Hang on. I'm just reading the chat here. There we go. All right, Len, I'm not sure what you wanted to ask, but yeah, that's the photo I got. Is it, am I getting a bit of rustling and clicking, Ashley, or am I okay? Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the world in 1971. I think Len, uh, actually, Len wants to unmute himself, so. Uh, I think you can unmute yourself, Lynn. You click on your own. Uh, I can now, but it, oh, it wasn't go. allowing me before then. Oh, Very okay. quickly, I won't interrupt you too long. In that um, 1971 photo, behind that main boomerang-shaped terminal building, on the right-hand side at the back is a small white building that was the Astrojet Space Center, where they had an Apollo space suit, and it was all about the Apollo moon program. Um, in this photo here, it's the, that, yeah, that one, the white building on the right behind the car park. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and it was on the right-hand corner of that white building. I went there a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we had, had, a, had some models and stuff which ended up at the, uh, at yeah. the Melbourne Museum, didn't they? 
Yeah. And yeah. I had a cinema there, I think, off of memory. The cinema lasted many years longer. The space centre itself was only there for a couple of years. I think because in those days it was so isolated, no one went there. Yeah, right. But they did have an Apollo moon suit and they had a lot of other little things, you know, so it was not bad. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Lee. All right, we'll keep going. Uh, so we'll zoom forward again. All right, so 71, uh, so the US, uh, people will note uh, during these presentations I've been doing since um, well, 2018, we've been talking about the Vietnam War. So the Vietnam War was raging on all through this period. So July the 1st uh, of 71, they made their, the US made their largest withdrawal of troops, 6,100 from South Vietnam. Uh, and that was since the beginning of the war, leaving still had 20, 236,000 troops, but it was half of what they had stationed there during the height of the war in 69. So it was eventually coming back. July 9, Henry Kissinger uh, he made a secret trip to the Pe People's Republic of China uh, aboard a jet from Pakistan. It was basically a fact-finding trip, and uh, he used a ruse of going to... Um, uh, an international um, event. Um, um, is the Asian nation jet. So he used the ruse of saying he was un incapacitated by a stomach ailment and he went over to China. So it was quite controversial at that stage because China was basically closed off to the Western world and um, he went there. In fact, uh, if you know who that person is in there, you'll see the remarkable resemblance, which I thought was quite striking. So that's actually Henry Kissinger. Um, the guy before was uh, Dr. Stranger. Uh, July 19, the South Tower of the World Trade Center in, in New York was topped off at uh, 1,362 feet. So I didn't have time to do the conversion. Uh, so that was the second tallest building in the world. And in 20, July 29, the UK opted out of the space race by cancellation of its Black Arrow launch vehicle, which was being launched at the time out of Woomera. And it was very notable for the fact that it had a very clear exhaust plume. And uh, knowledgeable people here will tell you why that is. Continuing on in Australia, uh, William McMahon replaced uh, John Gordon as a Prime Minister. As a party room, no confidence in John Gordon. Yvonne Gulligan defeated the defending world champion Margaret Court in the final at Wimbledon. So that was lovely. And Sonia McMahon, the wife of Billy McMahon, uh, captured the world attention as he wears a daring full length dress with a long slit down the sides, revealing her legs. So that was quite controversial. I remember that at the time. That's quite controversial. And Australia and New Zealand announced the pullout of troops from Vietnam as well in December. All right, what was happening in the pops? All right, so Daddy Cool were at the top of the charts in, uh, at the end of July with Eagle Rock. And some of us probably had these records. I've certainly got this one, the uh, Daddy Who, Daddy Cool record. And uh, you'll probably recognise a few of those tracks and a few of those bands. Um, and uh, good old times, yeah. All right, so let's get to the meat of the matter, the uh, Apollo 15 mission, which took place, uh, start, launched in July 26th and landed in August 7, came back to Earth August 7, uh, 71. So this is the crew members. It was uh, Dave Scott, the captain or commander. Al Warden was the command module pilot and uh, Jim, Jim Earl was the lunar module pilot. And they're there with their moon rover there. So going back a little bit in history, uh, March 26th, the uh, NASA announced the crew for the Apollo 15. Uh, it was a fifth planned moon landing. At the time of the announcement, two weeks before the launch of Apollo 13, NASA's plans indicated that Apollo 15 would be the last of the H series that was targeted launch around March of 71, but we all know what happened with Apollo 13. Um, uh, as planned for Apollo 14, Scott and Earl would use a modular equipment transport, a little golf cart type thing, uh, which 14 ended up using, and Apollo 15 was going to do that as well. Um, however, meanwhile, uh, first components of the uh, Apollo 15 spacecraft and vehicle 
uh, rocket vehicle or completing the assembly in various uh, facilities. The same ultimately destined for Apollo 15 past its critical design view at North American Rockwell plant in Danny, California. Look at that picture, not a computer to be seen. Well, I guess not computer as we know them anyway. Um, June, June the 7th, uh, June, June the 9th, 1970. Uh, so a bit over a year before the mission, 15, Apollo 15's ascent stage was uncradled at KSC. And July the 7th, the uh, S1C booster was struck from the turn basin at the AB. So that had been out, that had been assembled in, uh, and then taken out to the test end, fired, and then put onto the barge and sent over to, to KSC. Um, November the 2nd in 1970, Irwin and Scott were practicing with a lunar rover vehicle at Cinder Crater Field in Arizona. Um, in fact, that's quite interesting. I think we spoke about it uh, a couple of, uh, of these sessions ago where they actually aerial, they bombed a bunch of the fields out there to create craters for the guys to, to train in. I think if you go to Google Maps, you can still see those craters over there in Arizona. And December the 17th, uh, Scott and Irwin uh, were geology training in Hawaii. I love Irwin's uh, fishnet shirt. I remember those. But I was never brave enough to wear one of those. Um, and January the 29th in 1971, we've moved into 71 now. The Apollo support crew member uh, positions a camera on the lunar roving vehicle qualification in the Boeing. So you can see the, 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 the uh, control panel and the camera there up there. February the 10th, the, the Apollo 15 lunar module center stage was at uh, KSC undergoing uh, the testing and configuration. March 11th, the wide angle views of Dave Scott and Jim Irwin out in New Mexico. I really like that shot. And there's another wide angle shot and driving the rover there as well. Grover, they call it. It's a 1G rover, Grover. And March the 15th, uh, the aircraft carrying the lunar rover vehicle, the one that was actually going to be flown, uh, arrived in California, in uh, Kennedy Space Center. It's still folded in the configuration after it arrived, and you can see that on the right there. So it's quite compact, and we'll have a look at how that all works later on in this presentation. So what they did once they got there, April the 21st, they unfolded it and got it all set up, and the astronauts had a look at it with their gloves on and sort of get a, got familiarization with the vehicle itself to ensure that everything's as they expected and the various parts are working and configured in the correct manner. And then on the 21st, they actually suited up and did a fit check on the lunar rover vehicle with the actual lunar module ascent and descent stage that they will be flying on their mission. So everything was essentially connected up. You'll notice that the lunar rover vehicle is not on the ground. It's got a support frame underneath it. The reason being is that the, the vehicle's designed for one six gravity. If they'd let it on the wheels, it would have basically busted in half and collapsed the tires and everything would have gone sideways. So it's not designed for earth use. Uh, I'm not sure where the scratchings come from, Ash. I'll just saw you note then. I'm not sure that's still happening. It might be my head turning. I'm not sure. I'll try not to turn the head too much. All right. So uh, April the 28th, they actually installed the lunar rover vehicle into the lunar module in the quadrant there, preparation for moving the entire spacecraft to the VAB for stacking onto the Saturn vehicle in early May. So you can see it's all folded up there and um, how it... Uh, gets pulled into that area. It's quite a unique um, design. And meanwhile, they were doing training uh, on setting up their Apollo Lunar Service experiment package. 
which consisted of the basic seismometer experiment, heat flow experiment, lunar surface magnetometer, lunar laser ranging reflector, cold cathode gauge, super thermal ion detector, solar wind spectrometer, and a lunar dust detector. And we spoke about the lunar dust detector a few months ago with uh, Australia's own Brian O'Brien, who sadly passed away re recently, who designed and had that uh, had that experiment on on Apollo twelve and fifteen, and I think seven, six, 17, I think oh, eleven, twelve, and fifteen. I think he had it on. Some further training uh, in April, uh, so there's practicing the use of the drill, uh, and and Jim Allen trains on setting up the lunar surface experiments. You can see the the cables that run off to the various stations on that um, system. Uh, this is interesting. On this this uh, mission, they were going to be flying a um, a, a, a satellite that's going to be ejected out of the the, um, the scientific instrument module on the command module in lunar orbit. So um, so it's going to be first flown on this particular mission. So the ground crew is preparing to install the particle and field some satellite onto the sim bay. That's the satellite there. You can see, and this is the sim bay here with. Uh, it probably goes near that satellite thing. So this uh, part of this is a uh, camera, uh, which is called the uh, Apollo Lunar Mapping Camera System. And this is prior to its installation. You can see, it, get a bit of an understanding of zip laser altimeters. There's the camera itself, stellar camera, and the film canisters. So basically the, the unexposed film is in this canister and it goes through the system as you can see in the bottom photograph here and the exposed film goes into this canister you can see the handles on there where it will be retrieved by the spacewalking astronaut which in this case was uh, Al Warden and I happen to have <laughs> I happen to have not the film itself but I've got a first generation uh, copy of those one of those films in my possession I'll show it to you later on so basically, it's a, a second generation negatives of the lunar surface taken by those cameras, Apollo 15. Uh, it was directly produced from the original negatives. Uh, obviously, the original negatives are in cold storage with NASA. These are second generation. They were released after they'd done all the scanning of the, of the films themselves. So they no longer required the films, and I sort of got it through a friend of a friend of a friend. So... Uh, I was going to bring along to the meeting uh, this month, but unfortunately, we're not having a physical meeting. So I've just taken a couple of snaps here of the um, of the of the thing that I got, and you can see on the left hand side there that's uh, our warden going out to retrieve from the sim bay the um, the film exposed film. All right, and this is uh, an uh, a NASA engineer wearing actually Pete Conrad's training suit, practicing techniques required to retrieve that film canister. We saw that canister early on in that other slide. Okay, so the stack is coming together. We're uh, on May the 8th and 71, they uh, stack the spacecraft, command module, service module, lunar module on top of the Saturn V rocket. And then a couple of days later, they installed the boost protective cover. You don't see this picture very often. I thought it was quite interesting to see. So obviously there's the command module, nice and shiny and fresh. Then there's the boost protective cover, cover that goes over the top. I think it was basically fiberglass and cork uh, designed to uh, protect the spacecraft from the extreme heat and friction of the, of the ascent. So uh, that was one of the last things they did before they rolled the thing out. And speaking of rolling out, they rolled out the vehicle out to the pad on May the 11th. And these are the guys posing. Imagine standing there with your rocket flop rolling out behind you. Wouldn't that be so exciting? And look pretty pleased to be there. And I would be too. So that's it on the, on the, on the way out to the pad. And then, of course, on the pad at the, on the right-hand side there, ready to, ready to get configured. So obviously, while this is happening, all the training is still continuing on. And um, on the 14th of May, I like this picture. It's a close-up of Jim Irwin um, during a timeline study, which is basically putting all the pieces together, working out how much time you can. I'm not sure that it comes through very well. But you can see the 
beads of sweat on his face, uh, even though they were in a cooled spacesuit. They were out there in the Florida heat and working pretty hard, I suspect. So um, it just, just shows you the tough work that they, these guys are doing. And this actually comes back a little bit later in the story um, of, uh, of the mission itself. And while that was uh, the 24th of May, Jim Irwin, uh, Al Warden was explaining the Simbay um, uh, instruments and the satellite and the spacewalk that he's going to be doing. You can see uh, the space astronaut there and the camera that was used to monitor his progress. And there's him or Al Warden there on the, on the Simbay and this is Dave Scott, I think it was, helping out. And the same day, uh, they, uh, the moonwalkers, Jim Irwin and Dave Scott, were describing the features of the Lunar Rover vehicle to, uh, to reporters um, at Florida. A bit more comfortably dressed in that case. And then a little bit later on, they were, of course, doing lots of training. So June 7th, they were out in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, practicing uh, retrieval from uh, the water. Uh, where, of course, the, the, the capsule parachutes down and uh, they get taken out of the capsule and hoisted up by a helicopter. So they had to practice all those routines, etc. And then they had to enter um, the 21-day quarantine, pre-flight quarantine. Obviously, there was issues with uh, Charlie Duke exposing uh, Ken Mattingly in the lead up to Apollo 13 and they had that swap out of uh, um, uh, I do I'll come back to that mate. Um, yeah so they had to they had that exposure in Apollo lead up to Apollo 13 so after that they imposed this uh, pre-flight quarantine to mitigate any of those potential problems of of having astronauts uh, come in contact with people that might have, um, have um, germs or disease or whatever that they might muck up the whole flight routine. So there they are in their quarantine area looking at um, um, planning the mission, etc. So continuing on, July 20, they had their sort of last sort of minute uh, training in the simulators there at uh, KSC. That's the command module simulator and they were it would have been connected up uh, with the lunar module when the guys in the lunar module as well. All right, countdown demonstration test. This is basically a wet test and a dry test of all the processes used uh, involved in, in the actual mission. So they get dressed up in their suits, they go out to the pad, they climb into the vehicle, they pressurise it, do all the things they would normally do. Um, this is after the wet test, which is where they fill the, the rocket with uh, with the fuels, etc., and then they normally do, um, they don't involve the crew on that one for the safety factors. Then they do the dry test with the astronauts itself. itself. They go down to T minus, well, they do a simulated lift off, obviously, they don't light the candle. So here's the vehicle on the pad pressurizing up. You can see the venting of uh, excess uh, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, etc. Uh, Julian, I think for the training outdoors in the Florida heat, uh, that's a training suit. The actual flight suits, they, would, they wouldn't use them very much, but they had fit tests to be doing training probably indoors for those, just for the cleanliness factor. Um, for the first time, the lunar roving vehicle was going to be used. So previously, they'd just walked everywhere, and in Apollo 14, they, they used a, a golf buggy type thing, which they really found pretty damn and useless because they end up half time carrying the thing because it was more ha hassle than it was worse. So they had planned back in 69, in fact, they put out ideas to have uh, a, a, a vehicle, a, a car on board. So it was, uh, it was designed by Boeing and built by Boeing. It was battery operated, had an operational life of 72 hours and they could, uh, they could do almost uh, uh, 10 kilometers um, on the surface for that. Uh, it was equipped with a very simple uh, navigation system uh, and um, that doubled the traverse distances they could do, uh, etc. However, they always planned their EDAs so that if the thing broke down, they would always be within walking distance of the spacecraft, assuming that they had enough, well, 
if providing with enough uh, oxygen and supplies to get them back. So they never went uh, further than what they could walk back to within the time available. So they carefully planned that. So you can see the configuration here, it's quite a comprehensive bunch of tools and equipment on the, on the lunar rover. Okay, so this is uh, July 19th. This is the map showing the, um, the Hadley Apennine landing zone, showing the three planned traverses uh, using the lunar rover. Um, hopefully you can see that. That's the target point. And so there's three, three different uh, e explorations that they were going to be doing. This is an interesting picture. This is the backup astronauts for the Apollo, Apollo 15, Jack Schmidt. We ended up flying on Apollo 17, and the command module pilot for Apollo 12, Dick Gordon. And he was in line to be commanding a, a later mission. He obviously never got to fly back to the moon, unfortunately, never got to walk on that. So they were at, uh, at KSC there. Here's a nice picture of, uh, of, uh, of um, Jack Smith in training there. All right, we're getting down to the point here now. So this is uh, July the 20th. Uh, we talked before about them being in the different simulators. So that's um, Jim Irwin and Dave Scott in the lunar module training um, article at the Kennedy Space Center and uh, our warden is in the command module. So they would have connected those two vehicles up along with the ground control and actually run through simulations for all three uh, communication loops and uh, telemetry, et cetera, et cetera. So quite a comprehensive end-to-end -end, um, simulation. All right, so a couple of days later, on the 26th of July, they actually went ahead and launched uh, at 11.34 p.m., which is Melbourne time. Now, um, I'm going to... Sorry, Ash, what you, I can put the video out, in, out to the live stream while everyone's on Zoom as social time. I think what I'll do is if we can postpone this video till like after the next segment because it's like 45 minutes, isn't it? Yeah, 42 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so maybe um, we can have a social time at the end and anyone that wants to watch the video can watch it from the link or they can... Well, it, so it kind of tells the rest of the story that I wanted to tell, Ash. Um, okay. As I say, I've, I can... I can put the link in this chat and people can watch it at their, own, at their own leisure if the video doesn't work too well. Do you want me to just try the video and people can choose? Okay, yeah, just start it off and... All right, stand by calls. Okay, guys, I'm going to run a video now. Um, and if you find it unwatchable, um, I can send you a link in the chat to the video itself, which I've got on a, on a share drive, and you can watch it locally. But uh, let's see how this goes. Sometimes they work quite well, sometimes not. Um, am I still sharing, Ash? Yeah, we can see that. It's just not full screen. Okay. So let me know how this looks, guys. July 26, 1971. The time is 9.34 a.m. We're just a couple hundred feet away from Pad 39A. On it, Saturn V serial AS-510, the seventh manned moon mission. It is about to depart Earth for destinations beyond. Uh, we've lost the video there. Sorry, that's me.
On board, astronaut David Scott, veteran of Gemini 8 and Apollo 9, alongside rookies Jim Irwin, lunar module pilot, and Al Warden, command module pilot. Their destination, the moon. But this mission is different. This lunar flight is far more ambitious than any before attempted. It is the first J mission. That means there have been several extensive overhauls and upgrades throughout multiple systems in both spacecraft. Old hardware has been optimized. New hardware has been introduced. All of these changes coming together to enable a near doubling of the amount of return samples. Seven times the traversable distance once on the surface and twice the previous surface stay time. It is the most daring and bold lunar mission yet. Its exploration target on the lunar surface is the most unique and dangerous landing area ever considered. A place where strange science and celestial grandeur collide. The moon's largest mountain range, the Apennine Front. Located on the eastern border of the massive Mare Imbrium, the lunar mountain range known as the Apennines forms an arcing crescent that gradually bends to the northeast. Some of the peaks rise as high as 5 kilometers, or 3.1 miles, above the surface of the Mare. Their namesake is another mountain range, on Earth, one that spans the Italian peninsula. At the northern end of the Apennine range lies an open valley, Within it, one of the weirdest geological features ever observed by man. From the top down, it looks like a snake, writhing its way through the lunar regolith. This miniature canyon is called Rima Hadley, the Hadley Rill. Rills are long, sinuous depressions on the lunar surface that resemble channels. Their exact origin and the processes that helped form them is largely unknown. But one thing is certain, they do not exist on the Earth. Perhaps they are collapsed lava tubes. It just paused, Peter. I don't know if you hit flat pause thing. Oh. July I dropped 26. My first Continuous depressions on the lunar surface that resemble channels. Their exact origin and the processes that helped form them is largely unknown. But one thing is certain. They do not exist on the Earth. Perhaps they are collapsed lava tubes, resembling only the most visible part of a vast underground network that may penetrate many miles into the lunar crust. Perhaps they are merely just lava channels through which pyroclastic flows carved their presence into history. The small valley located between the Hadley Rill and the Apennine Front is, in the judgment of NASA, perhaps the most significant and scientifically attractive place on the entire lunar surface. Located in Quadrant 1 of the LEMS descent stage, with its chassis facing out and wheels folded in, is the first ever space car. The Lunar Roving Vehicle, or simply Lunar Rover, was commissioned in May of 1969. The 9.5 million dollar buggy is 122 inches long, 44.8 inches high, with a 90 inch wheelbase and 72 inch tread width. It weighs 462 pounds, or 209 and a half kilograms but it can carry upwards of a thousand pounds, or 453 kilograms. Powered by two 36 volt batteries, this thing will enable the astronauts to traverse over many kilometers of rugged lunar terrain without so much as breaking a sweat. Something that seemed especially pertinent now, after the uphill troubles encountered on the previous mission, Apollo 14. The astronauts can now easily sample their way across a wide variety of lunar features. 
the rover body and wheels are hinged. It simply needs to be unfolded once on the moon with a series of pulleys and ropes. According to its manufacturer, Boeing, the rover can travel up to 70 kilometers cumulative distance over the moon. Taking precautions for safety, NASA trains the astronauts for contingency scenarios of having to drop everything and run back to the LEM in the event the rover breaks down. And the astronauts are not to drive the rover any further than nine kilometers away from the LEM. Well, my first mission was Gemini 8 with Neil Armstrong, and we performed the first docking in space. And then I flew on Apollo 9 with Jim McDivitt and Rusty Schweikert, which was an Earth orbit test of all the lunar hardware and software. And then Apollo 15 was uh, first, as NASA called it, extended scientific exploration of the moon. And we were fortunate enough to have the uh, lunar rover. The rover gave us the capability to range a great distance from our base, the lunar module, and gather quite a bit of scientific data. And Falcon, you are go Anyway, I'm going to ditch the video. I have put the link to the video in the chat. So if you want to, if you want to see that, um, go ahead and have a look at that. What I'll do is I've just got some st standard slides to just take you through the rest of the story. Um, and it sort of covers what is kind of in the video, although it's not quite as much. Anyway, uh, I think we left off uh, when I had my second crash where we were just about to land or had to land on the moon. Um, Quite interesting. So this is the location of the of the actual landing site, um, and uh, as you would have seen in the video, um, Jim Moon says, "Boy, we've made contact." So they actually did a quite a heavy landing. Um, so as you can see in this picture, the uh, angle of the of the of the spacecraft was at about eleven degrees uh, tilted backwards. So. Um, um, Gray block there, Peter, over the top of the picture. I think you'll have. Oh, to that's the chat, chat box. Okay. Chat box. Yeah. So just yeah. move that off. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? All good. Yep, that's all good. Thanks, yeah. Peter. Okay. So um, it, it caused the lunar module's footbeds to be off the surface entirely and place the spacecraft at eleven degree angle. So after the uh, after the mission, uh, Scott said the altitudes looking down as we approach a landing was very difficult to pick out depressions as far as the shadow depressions there and the one in the rear of the foot pad finally rested couldn't see what they were really what was really there looked like it was relatively smooth according to him uh, touchdown they calculated it later the the descent over 6.8 feet per second and they were drifting to the north uh, very slightly uh, Scott cut off the engine at about 4.3 feet and they did 3, 4 for 1.2 seconds. Um, so they were, they were, the drop and the, and the tilt was within specs of the lunar module. So uh, it would have been a pretty um, tense couple of seconds there uh, to make sure they weren't going to go any further than what they actually ended up tilting. But anyway, they did, did well. And fortunately it tilted backwards so that they were able to get out the lunar rover if they had tilted forwards, it might have, may have been a bit of a problem, but anyway. So once again, here's a landing site. Uh, and um, what they did when they landed, rather than um, immediately go to sleep or immediately put their suits on and go out for a moonwalk, as, as kind of they did with Apollo 11, um, they decided they needed to have a, have a rest, a sleep, before they did a, uh, a, their first moonwalk. Uh, but they did um, they did do a an EVO, a stand up EVO. So this is a uh, um, 
a picture of, well, it's a drawing by a friend of mine, um, Doug Forrest. There was obviously no pictures of this, but this is where Scott opened the upper hatch and um, took a series of panoramic pictures of the surrounding uh, surface um, uh, at the landing site there. So you can see, once again, Doug Forrest, he's quite an amazing artist and uh, his, uh, his art is available uh, if you go to their website, apolloarts.com. And uh, yeah, so once again, th there was no photographs of this, of Scott himself, but if, these are the pictures at the bottom there, you can see that he took at the time um, of, the, of the surface. So that was the only time they ever did that. I didn't do it on Apollo 16 or 17. Uh, we saw this walk down the ladder before, so I'll skip over that. Um, so the, it was a very much of a science-focused mission. Uh, they had geolo lunar geologists had these sample collection, science experiments, orbital science experiments, lunar focused and space environment focused. So it was really crammed in uh, to have a lot of science here. Uh, so this is the uh, lunar sample drill that uh, Scott and Earl had used. You can see the in the little stand there. There the parts of, or the parts of the drill itself. Here's the drill. He's just fitting the, um, the the components of the of the drill into it and about to drill into the surface. Uh, he had quite a bit of trouble getting in it. The first thirty odd centimeters was fine, but after that it got very very dense and very difficult to to get uh, get further down. In fact, he pushed so hard uh, that he got bruised ends of his fingertips uh, trying to get the thing into the into the ground. Um, other experiments, soil mechanics, solar wind and laser range reflector, which is still in, in use today. You can point your laser at it and get a reflection back. Um, passive seismic experiment, heat flow experiment. You can see the LCP is the central stations here and the various components here. And on that central station is one of uh, Ryan O'Brien's uh, dust uh, collectors. Or dust, uh, yeah. Lunar service magnetometer. Uh, cold cathode gauge experiment, super thermal ion detector experiment. And this is like a tiny little lunar module, but it's actually the solar wind spectrometer and a lunar dust collector. Let's see where the dust collectors are near. Um, so obviously we had the lunar rover. Um, uh, it was very, very useful and uh, it came into its own uh, on the surface there. It gave them a lot of, a lot of uh, ability to move around. I think this is going to play. I might skip over it because I'll crash my computer again. <laughs> so this is the uh, the EVA. This is the landing side of the lunar module. So EVA one went along the edge of the rill down to Elbow Crater. EVA two down past June and Spur, and then the EVA-3 was uh, over to the rim again. The EVA-3 was the shortest of the three EVA. And it might be a little bit hard to see. This is the landing site, and the EVA is overlaid on a, a map of the uh, of Manhattan. There's a World Trade Center, et cetera, just to get rid of the scale of where they were and how far they went for people that are familiar with New York. And there's the EVA path uh, on the overlaid on a photograph of the actual landing site itself. And this is a, a picture from, um, from the uh, lunar orbiter uh, a few years later, a number of years later, you can see the LSAP, you can see the lunar module descent stage, the flag and the road there. So, all your hopes is out there. Uh, moon mail, this is where they um, basically cancelled uh, a bunch of uh, uh, U.S. Post Office uh, envelopes with a stamp on the surface of the moon. There's actually a video of that, and um, uh, you can watch that uh, in that link that I posted. Um, this actually caused a fair bit of controversy, given that uh, I think they were permitted to take a couple of hundred, and they actually took 500, and 300 they decided they were going to sell off to the, or they were going to pass off through a dealer, and they got into a fair bit of trouble for that. They did an experiment uh, confirming Galileo's uh, free fall of a hammer and a, and a hammer and a feather on the surface. 
and a few years later, Albine, the, the, the painter, the Apollo 12 command, uh, lunar module pilot, uh, did a painting of that same experiment, which is quite nice. They also left a lunar memorial. Uh, they left a, a, a card with listing all of the astronauts and cosmonauts that had died up to that time, and um, a figurine symbolising the basically the fallen astronaut. Uh, back in lunar orbit, our wardens up around there zooming around in the command and service module. So they did metric and panoramic cameras on the SIMBA, the laser altimeter, S band transponder, and X ray fluorescent spectrometer experiment on there. So he kept himself very busy. There was also a gamma ray spectrometer, alpha particle, orbital mass spectrometer, and a biostatic radar experiment. And before leaving lunar orbit, they released a sub satellite. And it's a couple of still shots here of that going out. And then on the way back to Earth, uh, Al went off to retrieve those film canisters that I was talking about earlier. So here's a, here's a pre-mission painting by, by somebody. I should get the name of that, but I don't have it with me. Um, showing uh, Scott in the hatch and uh, our warden out in the, the film canister. And there's a still from the films that were taken at the time there. It's quite interesting, that picture on the right-hand side there, you can see the blistering on the outside surface of the, of the of the service module, this is from the thrusters, firings, etc. So you can see it filled up a fair bit of heat there. Uh, end of the mission came uh, with uh, obviously with splashdown. So uh, on descent, the one of the parachutes failed. It was believed afterwards that uh, venting of the hydrazine fuel from the command module may have blown into some of the, the shroud lines of the parachute and um and fouled that cause that not to open uh the system was designed to have a redundancy so they were able to land safely with two parachutes but it was a bit faster than they would like and i also read the other day that apparently al warden or one of the astronauts reckoned that they saw some of the lines of one of the other parachutes starting to to, to break so that could have been quite a significant issue if it had done that when they were at altitude you know there you see at the bottom the the hard landing in the water and of course the guys in the raft after they got out of the capsule so they they were pretty happy um some of the samples that they returned um that on the left left picture dave scott and joe allen uh, examine um a sample there and uh, and this uh, basalt uh, um, sample on the right was basically they they, they named it the um, the Genesis rock because of the uh, rocks properties etc. Oh, sorry, that's not the Genesis rock. The bigger one. The next one's a Genesis rock. This is it here. And uh, it's a two hundred and sixty nine gram piece of pure and north of site, dubbed the Genesis Rock by the press that Dave and Jim collected at Spur Crater. So basically the numbers, they were uh, 18 hours and 37 minutes outside the lunar module, 170 pounds or 77 kilograms of samples, and approximately 12 days of mission time. So it's quite a long mission. Uh, the Endeavour, as they named their capture command module, is now located at the National Museum of the US Air Force at Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Now, have a look at that uh, picture there. Particularly, take note of the of the hatch. The next picture is uh, taken directly after the capture was brought out um, of the water. You can see all that clapped on film on it, and the the blistered and uh, um, scorched surface of the command module. So what they did is they peeled a lot of that, all that stuff off uh, um, out there and, and you can actually find that, that clapped on tape uh, film uh, for sale by various collectors around the world. Quite well sought after. I don't have any of that, but i love to. Uh, Jim Irwin, uh, he is... Uh, He's passed, he passed away in 20, uh, 1991. Uh, as I think I may have alluded, uh, well, maybe the video that I was going to show you, uh, on the first EVA, his uh, drink uh, dispenser in his suit failed. He wasn't able to get any fluid. 
and uh, he didn't say anything to, to Mission Control or even Dave Scott. And he, they reckon he lost about nine pounds of body weight in that first EVA, so he was really dehydrated. Um, it's not sure about how that might have affected him later on. Um, they certainly uh, found that there was a, a reduction in their potassium um, and so subsequent missions in Apollo 16, for example, they they uh, added the potassium to their diet, which uh, caused a lot of sorts of uh, side effects, which I'll talk about um, uh, in another, in the presentation we do on Apollo 16. So, uh, but he did have um, three major heart attacks after he returned, uh, one less than two years after the mission, when he was 43. He underwent an emergency triple bypass. Once again, NASA doubted that the incidents on the mission related to those issues he had. Um, however, pre flight tests indicated him having a tendency for cardiac arrhythmias during this dream exercise, which I was amazed that they would have let him fly with that, but anyway. Uh, and once again, he, on August uh, 8th, 20, 1991, he suffered another heart attack and the attempts to resuscitate him were unsuccessful. So he was the first one to, of the 12 guys to pass away, sadly. Uh, Al Warden, uh, he died in 2020, fairly recently. Uh, he'd been suffering from infection uh, at home in League City, Texas. He was hospitalised. Uh, he was convalescing at Sugar Land facility at the time of his death. So uh, that picture there on the right is taken in 2019. Um, Mike Abdullah and I, um, I don't know whether we spoke to him or had it, saw him. We were close proximity to him anyway. At the 2018 Space Fest, I'm not sure whether Len Halpern or any other people that we know at Space Fest met or had any time with, with Al, but he was a, a great guy, very outspoken, very opinionated and not shy to say, um, say his mind. Um, in fact, he squarely blamed uh, Dave Scott for that uh, postal issue that I mentioned before a few slides ago. It was basically Dave Scott's idea um, to do that and the other two guys got thrown into the mess. So uh, another rev flew again. Um, so today, this is what it looks like at, uh, at uh, Hadley Base. Um, the, ascent, the descent stage is there. The, obviously, the ascent module's taken off and they park the lunar rover near the, uh, not too far from the lunar module and the camera on that, uh, on the lunar rover actually watched the, um, watch the ascent of the uh, ascent stage. Um, unfortunately, by that stage, I think they had problems with the servos and they weren't able to track the ascent. It's a still shot of the ascent stage departing. On later missions, they, they actually got better than that. In Apollo 17, they actually finally um, we were able to track it up until it sort of tilted away from them. So it was quite, quite an impressive piece of camera work. All right. Um, so if you want to get more information, uh, these are some websites uh, that I can point you to. Uh, basically, if you go to NASA, Apollo 15, you go to the History Office, etc. Uh, Apollo Lunar Landing Sites you can look at. Um, for the uh, video that I showed or attempt to show, I must hand it to this, uh, uh, it's a guy uh, who does handmade film, handmade documentaries. Um, actually it's handmade or homemade? Um, uh, it's, it's fantastic and um, there's a full length video that I, that I edited down to show tonight. Unfortunately, I had failures as you, as you no doubt saw. Um, but yeah, if you, if you look up, uh, if you look up that, um, it's home homemade documentaries. So if you do a quick search on you on YouTube and Apollo 15 or whatever, you can watch the entire video. Um, and there's also other general stuff there available for you. All right, that's it from me. Um, yep, yeah, yeah, I'll do a wrap up right now, guys. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, we could probably unmute everything and um, have a chat. Um, All right. Well, um, what I might do now is I'll stop the recording and then stop the stream, and that way everyone can.
get on. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending on the live stream and in the chats.